And the Oscar goes to. It could be an interesting exercise to go back and watch classic films to see their interpretations of different groups and races of people. These questionable portrayals of African Americans, Asians, etc. could range from hilarious ideas of how different races and cultures act to downright offensive villains that gave the entire race a bad name. I don't want to give the impression that all old films are ignorant of other cultures and peoples. There are plenty of silent and early sound films that had honest and truthful representations of different races. What a lot of people tend to remember, however, are those many films that didn't show certain groups in the best light. Westerns are particularly criticized for the depiction of Native Americans, often understandably. Imagine my surprise when I sat down to watch a 1930s film with not only an extremely pro-Native American stance, but also a strong message of tolerance. Cimarron was the first Western to win Best Picture, and the last until Dances with Wolves in 1990. It was also the first to get seven nominations and to win multiple awards. And it was the first of only two Best Picture wins for RKO Radio Pictures. It met with great critical success when it premiered, but unfortunately didn't do well at the box office due to its high cost and it coming out during the height of the Great Depression. Cimarron is based on the 1929 book of the same name by Edna Ferber. She was a Pulitzer Prize winning novelist, playwright, and short story writer who wrote, among other things, the book Showbo, which inspired the classic musical, and the novel Giants, the basis for the 1956 James Dean film. Our story tells Ivanchi Kravat, played by silent star Richard Dix, his wife, played by Irene Dunn, and their family trying to make a life for themselves in Oklahoma, which has just been opened for settlement by the government. Kravat is a reporter who opens a newspaper in the town of Osage. Along with writing his paper, he fights against outlaws. And social injustices. Who was it that said? Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. She is indeed heavy laden. With the persecution of her own sex, my gentleman, a thief or murderer, may sin alone and is alone to blame, but this woman is not alone. Social order is her accomplice. If she is guilty, then all in this room are guilty. Gravad is an open-minded guy, welcoming almost everyone with open arms. He befriends and saves the life of a Jewish man, he's kind to the Native Americans in town, he gives the first sermon at a church that he deems as a church for all religions, and all of these people are portrayed respectfully and true to life. Well, there is one person who could have been depicted with more reverence. Rock of watermelons there, Isaiah! Yeah, Isaiah, the young servant boy to the Gavats, is an uneducated black character with not much screen time and whose only real purpose is to serve as comic relief, a common sight in movies of the time. As you can tell by the clip, the character is nothing short of racist. Isaiah and the watermelon joke are the lowest points of the film. I probably wouldn't have as much of a problem with it if the movie was like others of its era regarding stereotyping races. Isaiah's scenes are embarrassing and so painful to watch as it is, but knowing how progressive the rest of the film is makes them even worse. For its first half or three quarters, Cimarron is an entertaining story with important social messages. It really falls apart though after Yancey, who's constantly restless and possessed with the need to be part of history, leaves Osage to settle another part of Oklahoma. His wife doesn't approve and so Yancey leaves her and the family behind. He comes back about five years later. What irks me about this story development is Yancey never gets properly called out for leaving his family. Sir's wife gets mad and yells at him for it, but it's never really addressed and resolved in a satisfactory way. Although this does highlight how strong the woman Dunn's character is, and informs the audience about an aspect of Dick's character, for me it serves to distract from the greater messages of the film. Once that story thread was introduced, I lost a lot of sympathy for Yancey and the beliefs he was fighting for. This gets further compounded when he leaves again at the end of the film for a much longer period of time. I'm not totally against showing this aspect of the character. Actually, I'm all for it because it makes him more fallible and human. 
I just wish it didn't steal so much attention away from more important facets of the movie. The pacing is also all over the place in this section. Cimarron takes place in multiple time periods between 1889 and 1929. The movie spends a sufficient amount of time in each period up until the last quarter of the film, where it jumps around way too much and doesn't spend a lot of time in any one period, which makes the film come off like it's rushing to get through the remainder of its material. Despite story hiccups, the portrayal of Isaiah, and its pacing issues, Cimarron holds up for the most part. It's certainly not for everyone, and I can see why someone wouldn't like it. It has a corny, bad vibe in its writing and acting that could turn a lot of people off. Oh, I'm thankful I've got you. We've got each other. And our home. Oh, sugar, sugar, I love you. Hell and high water all the way. There's never been anybody but you, and you know it. Oh, hold me close. That being said, it deserves praise and a watch if you're itching for a unique 1930s film that isn't afraid to stand up for the little guy.